thank you again to CyberSide for having me. Uh, I'm taking on a quite a large topic today. It's called intravitreal injections. Since we, I'm, uh, we are talking to people from all over the world, I'm going to try to keep it as basic as possible and see what all we can cover today. So uh, let's get started. So intravitreal injections are injection of drugs through the pars plana directly into the vitreous cavity. It's a gold standard for many retinal diseases. And it's very important because it's highly targeted and it bypasses the blood ocular barrier. Th thus, it gives a maximum therapeutic concentration with minimal side effects. And that's why uh, minimal systemic side effects. And that's why it's a very useful drug which directly treats these retinal diseases. So how, how did this start about? The first intravitreal injection was done by Ohm et al, where an air bubble was uh, put inside the eye to tampen out retinal detachment. Later, intravitreal penicillin was tried in endophthalmatis and rabbits by Von Salmon et al. Pim et al had multiple case reports of successful treatment of endophthalmatis with intravitreal antibiotics in 1970 to 1974. And later, the first intravitreal injection, which was approved by the FDA, was uh, vitravine for CMV retinitis. And now we have plenty of intravitreal, anti uh, intravitreal agents, which I'll be describing further. Yeah. So the types are the most commonly used one is definitely the antivascular endothelial growth factors. Uh, I'll come to the indications a little later when I'll explain them in detail. But the examples are ranibizumab, bevacizumab, pegaptinib, aflibacept, and the newer ones such as brolucizumab and ferisimab, and we also have biosimilars. We also have steroids, which are commonly used. Um, the examples are triamcinolone, dexamethasone, and flucinolone. The other things that are end antibiotics for endophthalmitis, such as vancomycin, amicacin, etc., antifungals such as uh, voriconazole, amphotericin B, fluconazole, antivirals for viral posterior uveitis and retinitis, ganciclovir, foscanet, etc., and chemotherapeutic agents and other miscellaneous agents which are newer compared to uh, the previously existing ones such as methotrexate, melphalan, infliximab, and, and adalimumab, which are used for infectious, which are for non-infectious uveitis. I won't be talking much about these since they are much newer. I'll be covering uh, mostly the techniques and uh, the most common agents. So let's come to anti-VEGFs. Um, VEGF means vascular endothelial growth factor, which is responsible for the growth of blood vessels. In abnormal uh, retinal diseases, it can cause new vessel growth and this causes leakage and thus causes retinal swelling. It thus benefit the patients by decreasing the abnormal and harmful new blood vessel formation and by decreasing the leakage and swelling of the retina. So common indications we use this for are wet or neovascular age-related macular degeneration, CR, that is central retinal vein occlusion or branched retinal vein occlusion uh, with its neovascular complications or for macular edema associated with these, diabetic macular edema or proliferative diabetic retinopathy, Choroidal neovascular membranes due to other causes other than age-related, that is myopic trauma and judge streaks, etc. in neovascular glaucoma, and we can also use it preoperatively about five to seven days before surgery for uh, proliferative diaptic retinopathy and vitreous hemorrhage. There are also some expanding indications such as Eels disease, refractive, uh, refractory post-surgery CME, Coates disease in retinopathy of prematurity to radiation retinopathy. In the anterior segment also it can be used uh, for iris neovascularization, uh, before keratoplasty to reduce corneal neovascularization, for pterygium surgeries and for trabeculectomy for wound healing and modulation. It is contraindicated uh, when there's a fibrovascular proliferation threatening the macula, when there's an active ocular or periocular inflammation, when there's uncontrolled hypertension, in recent MI or stroke or cardiovascular disease, when there's a known hypersensitivity to any of the molecules, uh, any of the anti of agents, and in pregnancy and lactation. So let's come to the first poll question. What was the first FDA-approved anti-VEGF? Okay, so most of you have seemed to have answered Bevacizumab, but you need to remember that the first FDA-approved anti-VEGF was Pegatinib in 2004. Later, it was Renibizumab in 2006. In 2011, it was Aflibercept. 2019, we had Brolucizumab. And 2022, we had Ferisimab. Bevacizumab is still not FDA approved and it is an off-label usage. So it is not the first FDA approved anti-VEGF, although we do use it commonly, but it's still not FDA approved. So this table gives us an idea about the different anti-VEGFs. Uh, I'll just go through the important points. Pegatinib is not used as much anymore because we have realized that ranibizumab and aflibercept do have better affinity to VEGF-A. 
Bevacizumab is uh, attaches to VEGF A of all forms. Ranibizumab has also attaches to VEGF A of all forms and has stronger affinity. Aflibercept has an ad additional advantage where it also is a, has a VEGF binding property to placental growth factor. So this makes it even more effective than Ranibizumab. And the dose is 0 0.3 milligram every six weeks for pegatinib. Bevacizumab is given 1.25 milligram per 0 0.05 ml every four weeks. Ranibizumab is given 0 0.5 milligram per 0, uh, uh, per 0 0.5 ml every four weeks. And uh, Aflibercept is given 2 milligram per 0 0.05 ml every four weeks. Um, Bevacizumab is used uh, widely, even though it's not FDA approved, because it does have the advantage of being a lesser cost compared to the other anti -VEGFs. Newer anti -VEGFs, which have come in the last three to four years are, uh, and there are some which are still in the phase trials and, not, and are not FDA approved. The list is Conversept, Dolucizumab, Port Delivery System with Ranibizumab, Abisipar, and Farisimab. I just want to talk about two important ones which are FDA approved. The first one is Brulucizumab. It is six milligram and goes by the trade name Bioview or Pagenix. And um, it is a humanized monoclonal single chain variable fragment against VEGF A. It is FDA approved for wet AMD and DME. It has a higher molar dosing because it has a lower molecular weight and it has a T half of three days. However, they've seen in, multi, in all the studies that is Hawk and Arier in wet AMD and Crestel and Kite in DME, that it has an uh, incident suitable for these conditions or also not FDA approved for retinal vein occlusions. So it, we have to be a little careful while we're using brolucizumab and make sure we know the indication what we're using it for. And the other one, which is the latest one, is ferisimab, which is 6 milligram. It is a bispecific antibody which is against VEGF A and angioboitin 2, and hence it has more sustained vascular stability. And it is also FDA approved for wet AMD and DME. So the adverse effects of anti VEGF agents can be either ocular or systemic. The ocular ones, the most uh, uh, important thing that we need to look out for in these patients is, is endophthalmitis. They can also be small side effects such as subconjunctival hemorrhage or any other ocular hemorrhage. They can have raised intraocular pressure and glaucoma, and this is more common in patients with pre-existing glaucoma. They can have cataract formation, especially if the, lens, if, the, uh, the if there was a lens touch during the uh, intravitreal injection. They can have retinal tears and detachment, and intraocular inflammation and retinal vasculitis, especially with brolucizumab. And rare ones are retrobulbar optic neuritis, NAION, corneal melt, sixth palsy, and retinal toxicities. Systemic side effects can be myocardial infarctions or transient ischemic attacks, deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and thrombophlebitis. Coming to steroids, uh, the injections that we commonly use are triamcinol and ac acetonide or TA, but we do use an implant called dexamethasone implant, which is also dex the most commonly. We also use implants such as flucinolone, acetonide, which can be either reticert, eluvion, or utic. And uh, there's also an implant of triamcinol acetide known as ivation. So the indications for steroids are usually pseudophagic cystal macular edema, diabetic macular edema, macular edema associated with vein occlusions, neovascular AMD, uveitic CME in intermediate and posterior uveitis, uh, and other macular edemas such as radiation retinopathy. They are contraindicated in patients with hypersensitivity, in active uh, ocular periocular infections, in glaucoma patients with a cup disc uh, ratio of more than 0 0.8. DEX implant, that is also DEX, it ad is additionally contraindicated or it has to be used in caution with patients with torn posterior capsules in aphakic eyes or those with an anterior chamber or uh, SFIOL due to the risk of migration of the implant into the anterior chamber. So there are, multiple, there are multiple case reports which have shown that this implant can migrate into the anterior chamber, especially in patients with these kind of conditions. Triamcinol acetonide is an intravital uh, injection, which is usually given by a 27 gauge needle. It has a prolonged duration of action due, its, due to its insoluble form. It acts as a depot injection when injected into the sequestered cavity. Its biological T half after intervital injection is 18.6 days. Coming to poll question two, what is Ozodex? A, it's a biodegradable 300 uh, microgram of dexamethasone. B, it's non-biodegradable non -biodegrad non but 300 uh, microgram. 
C is biodegradable 700 microgram and 400, uh, 4 is non-biodegradable 700 microgram. Okay, so again, most of you got biodegradable 300 microgram, right? But the actual answer is it is a 700 microgram biodegradable uh, DEX implant. It is FDA approved and it's bioerodible and it has an extended release uh, in the uh, vitreous cavity. So it can last up to three to six months and it's used in RVO associated macular edema, diabetic macular edema. It can also be used in non-infectious posterioritis. Off-label use is seen in Irvin gas syndrome, neovascular AMD, and other conditions like vasoproliferative retinal tumors, Coats disease, radiation maculopathy, retinitis pigmentosa, etc. So in this diagram, in this picture, fundus photo, you can see a whitish uh, implant, uh, whitish uh, material. This is the osotex implant in, which is injected in this patient, probably for diabetic macular edema. The adverse effects of this uh, steroids are cataract formation. Elevated IOP and glaucoma, again, more common in patients with pre-existing glaucoma. Endophthalmitis, sterile endophthalmitis, especially in triamcinone acetonide, where it, because of its white crystalline property, it gives an impression of endophthalmitis, but actually it is not uh, uh, infectious endophthalmitis. And DEX implant or other steroid implants have a specific risk of hypotony and migration of the anterior chamber, which can lead to coronal edema and endothelial damage. Coming to the uh, third important intravisual drug that we give is antimicrobials. So these antimicrobials are given in acute postoperative endophthalmitis, delayed onset postoperative endophthalmitis, also post-injection endophthalmitis, bleb-related endophthalmitis, traumatic, endogenous, etc. They can be either antibacterial, antifungal, or antiviral. Antibacterial, the most commonly used ones are vancomycin, ceftazidim, amikacin. Antifungal are amphotericin B and voriconazole and antiviral argancyclovir and fosconet, which is used for acute retinal necrosis and CMV retinitis. So I'm just going to concentrate a little bit on antibacterial and antifungal, which are most commonly used. So coming to poll question three, what are the drugs of choice for acute postoperative endophthalmitis? A, amikacin plus ceftazidim, B, vancomycin plus ceftazidim, C, vancomycin plus amikacin, or D, amikacin plus cefazolin. Uh, so most of you got it right. It is vancomycin plus ceftazidim. That is the most common combination that we use in acute postoperative endophthalmitis. So uh, just having a rough idea, vancomycin works against gram positive, and it is a drug of choice for staphylococcus and MRSA. And ceftazidim works against gram negative, and it produces levels greater than the MIC when 2.25 milligram is injected intravitreally for about 48 hours. So these are the two most common ones we use. Amikacin has not, uh, is not used as much because it is causing macular toxicity. And cefazolin is not as effective as ceftazidim against gram negative. So we do use vancomycin and ceftazidim more commonly. For antifungals, we use amphotericin B and voriconazole. Amphotericin B has high affinity for ergosterol component of the fungal cell wall and binds to it, causing alterations in cell permeability and cell death. It is effective against aspergillus, fusarium, and dermatitious fungi. Voriconazole, on the other hand, helps to inhibit the fungal cytochrome P450 mediated 14 alpha lanosterol demethylation, which is an essential step in fungal ergosterol synthesis. It acts against fusarium, candida, yeast, and filamentous fungi. And these are the two most commonly used drugs intravitreally for fungal endophthalmitis. Dexamethasone is specifically used when there is a uh, severe inflammation. If the dosage is 400 mcg per, per 0.1 ml, it should not be used in fungal endophthalmitis and it's specifically used in acute postoperative endophthalmitis or post-traumatic endophthalmitis. It helps to decrease inflammation and has a T half of about 3 to 3.34 hours. So what is the dosing of antibiotics and endophthalmitis for bacterial? For vancomycin, we use it as 1 milligram per 0.1 ml. For septazidim and cefazolin, 2.25 milligram per 0.1 ml. And, and amikacin is 0.2 to 0.4 milligram per 0.1 ml. When there's an endophthalmitis with severe vitreous inflammation, as I mentioned, we do need to use dexamethasone along with vancomycin and septazidim. And that dosage is 0.5 milligram per 0 per 1 ml. For fungal, we use amphotericin B, which is 5 microgram per 0.1 ml. And variconozole, which is 100 microgram per 0.1 ml. So it is very easy to... Uh, difficult to remember the doses and we do need to dilute these drugs because they don't come directly in these doses and they all come in separate vials. So this table is 
uh, not easy to remember. It is not something that we can by heart and keep with us. We do have to carry this, carry a picture such as this along with us so that we know exactly how to dilute these uh, uh, drugs, uh, which can, uh, and we need to get the correct concentration to inject intravitreally. So I recommend everybody has a picture like this uh, or intravitreal and prepare the aliquots for these intravitreal drugs. So common adverse effects of this endophthalmitis is uh, for vancomycin, you can get hemorrhagic occlusive vasculitis and amikacin, you get macular toxicity. And that's why amikacin is, and gentamicin was earlier used, which also caused retinal toxicity. And that's why it's also avoided now. <clears throat> so in endophthalmitis specifically, I'm just concentrating a little bit, uh, taking two, three slides just to explain what we do in endophthalmitis, because giving an injection in endophthalmitis is different than giving an injection in any other case. So for in endophthalmitis, we obviously have to find out what the organism is causing. So we have to do an anterior chamber or a vitreous tap prior to the injection. And whenever we prepare the injection, we need to give it immediately or as soon as possible. A limbus or pass planar route is uh, decided according to the phacic status of the patient. We can give the vancomycin separately and we can combine septazidum and dexamethasone together and give it. And we do need to do a parasynthesis after injection because there might be an increase in uh, intraocular pressure uh, if we have not done an AC tap before that. So coming to how to do an AC tap, we do it under topical anesthesia. We place an eyelid speculum and put povidone iodine. Uh, usually we use a 30 gauge needle with a one ml syringe and we have to enter into the anterior chamber parallel to the iris, preferably at the six o'clock position with the tip of the needle at the mid peripheral iris. After that, we need to aspirate about 0.1 to 0.2 ml. It is important to avoid lens or iris touch. Then we need to use a cotton tipped applicator at the entry point where we enter the anterior chamber and give an application of gentle pressure for 10 to 20 seconds. We then patch the eye and reevaluate after 30 to 60 minutes. This, uh, why do we need to reevaluate? We need to look for anterior chamber depth and if there's any high femur or not while we were making the. Um, uh, while well, we're making the AC tap. The other thing that we can do is a vitreous tap. So Flynn et al. has described this outpatient clinic tap and inject procedure. So as you can see in the pictures, uh, they do a standard preparation. They can they usually give a retrobulbar or peribulbar block and a speculum is placed. And using a 23 gauge butterfly needle with a 10 cc syringe, uh, that's what is used. So it is entered and around 0.2 to 0.5 ml of vitreous is removed by slow suction followed by antibiotic injection through the pass planar. So vitreous tap can also be done in case you're not doing a vitrectomy. Uh, so AC tap or vitreous tap, uh, vitreous tap will obviously give us a better uh, uh, analysis. So vitreous tap can also be done in an OPD setting. Uh, it's important, uh, how do we analyze these samples? We need to send it for uh, gram staining, JAMSA staining, KOH and uh, acid fast bacilli. We also need to send it for culture, which takes a little bit longer. We can start empirical treatment based on the gram stain or the KOH, but we do need to wait for the final treatment and the antibiotic sensitivity based on the uh, bacterial culture, fungal culture, and we can also send for PCR, for P-acnes, U-bacterial or pan-fungal genomes, and antibiotic sensitivity. So bacterial cultures are usually blood agar, chocolate agar, McConkie, brain heart infusion uh, broth, and anaerobic can be thioglocaloid, brucella, etc. Fungal, we usually do it for saborodextrose agar. So coming to the main thing that I wanted to cover in this is 10 tips for intravitreal injections. So let's start one by one. First, we need to establish the correct diagnosis. By this, I mean, whatever we are treating, whether it's a diabetic macular edema with subretinal fluid, whether it's a branched retinal vein occlusion with uh, macular edema, whether it's a neovascular age-related macular degeneration, we have to make sure that the injection that we are giving for this patient is indicated for this uh, patient and whether they've responded previously, we need to know the history of the patient and we do uh, have to establish a correct diagnosis before we go ahead with the injection. So that is step one. Step two, prior to treatment, with anti-VEGF or any other injection, we do have to treat any active infection. So block neo nasolacrimal duct or any positive regurgitation of the lacrimal sac, any active blepharitis or mebomitis or any conjunctivitis should be treated prior to the infection. If we go ahead with the infection, uh, if we go ahead with the anti-VEGF during uh, 
the, if these things still exist, then we will end up with an endophthalmitis. Pre-injection, we need to do a couple of things. One, confirm the name of the patient and the eye that you're injecting. So it's like a timeout. Then you confirm the indication and type of intravitreal injection you're giving. So if you are if you're doing multiple patients in the same day, make sure you if you're giving aflibercept for that patient, it's that patient who's receiving the aflibercept. It's very important to get an informed written consent. In this, you mention the indication, you explain the procedure, you explain the risks involved, you explain the alternate options, and especially when it comes to bevacizumab, you have to explain that it's off label. And you have to specifically mention this because the patients will not be aware of it otherwise. Pupillary dilatation prior to injection, it can be done or it cannot be done. Whereas uh, I, in, uh, it, it has been recommended that in uh, newer peop the people who are giving anti for the first time, it's preferred to, to dilate the pupil, but it's not always necessary to dilate the pupil. Coming to the equipment. So you can see on the left, most of the equipment is uh, uh, pressed. Uh, present in this uh, picture that you need to use cotton buds. You need to use a bud soaked in povidone iodine. You need calipers. You need forceps. You need a 1 ml syringe along with a 30 gauge needle. You need an 18 gauge needle. You also need an eyelid speculum. The other things that you need are a sterile drape. Sterile drape, uh, nowadays they say there's no evidence to support routine use, although I prefer to use a sterile drape, but it's not always indicated as long as the eyelashes are away from the area of injection. Povidone iodine 10% and 5% and an anesthetic. So this is the equipment that you need to arrange before you go ahead with the injection. Coming to anesthesia, it can be the topical or subconjunctival. Topical drops or gel, that is 1% proparacaine drops are usually uh, preferred. That's what I use. Uh, subconjunctival lidocaine can also be uh, given using a 27 gauge or a 30 gauge needle in the location of the injection. Now, sterile cotton uh, swab soaked in 4% lidocaine can also be applied to the injection area to give some uh, anesthesia before you give the injection in that area. So coming to the fifth point, asepsis and disinfection. This is very, very important because endophthalmitis is one of the most feared complications of it. So we need a sterile operation or injection room. You, uh, we have to do hand washing, wear gloves wear a mask and they say minimize talking. So there should be less uh, discussion uh, after the patient is on the table because that helps to reduce the contaminants in the room. Povidone iodine is the most important uh, thing when it comes to asepsis and disinfection. Povidone iodine 10% is used to clean the lashes and the lid and povidone iodine 5% drops is applied in the conjunctival sac and over the ocular surface after the eyelid speculum is placed. This helps to decrease the bacterial colonization and as well as the risk of endophthalmitis. And it's been proven in multiple studies that this is the main thing that helps to decrease the risk of endophthalmitis. So two to three minutes after povidone iodine painting, a sterile linen, linen and plastic sticking eye drape is applied. A sterile speculum is used to open the eyes and povidone iodine is 5% 5 5 is applied to the conjunctival surface and topical anesthetic drops are then applied and then you reapply povidone iodine 5%. So basically povidone iodine 5% should be the last drop you apply on the eye before you go ahead for the injection. The speculum helps to retract the eyelids and prevents the needle tip from touching the lids or lashes prior to the needle insertion. That's why uh, it's very important to keep the eyelashes away from the needle tip and away from the area of injection. You can also do this by taping the eyelashes in certain patients when you're not able to retract it properly. So I'm just showing a video about how the cleaning should be done. This is with povidone iodine 10%. Uh, it, there'll be multiple sweeps across the eye and the entire eye should be cleaned uh, with the povidone iodine. Um, and uh, the surrounding area should also be cleaned after you clean the eye. Then use a povidone uh, iodine 5% to clean the conjunctival sac. Uh, keep the eye open. Uh, you, uh, even, even if you're repeating anesthetic, you have to apply a povidone iodine before you start the injection. And um, this uh, video shows us how to drape in a patient. Um, although there have been uh, the latest recommendations do not recommend uh, sterile draping. I prefer draping the patient because it does give us a better way of retracting the eyelashes also. So in this, uh, you can see that the sterile drape is being used and it's being placed over the eye of the patient by retracting the eyelids up and down. And then the sterile drape is opened. Uh, 
Okay, so sterile drape is now covering the eye as they point into it. And now you can see it's covering the eye. We can use um, a scissors to open up the area, uh, to cut the area and make an opening. And then we can use an eyelid speculum to retract the eyelids. So you can see here the eyelid speculum is being used to retract the eyelids and the eyelashes are away from the ocular surface. So draping does help uh, additionally in preventing eyelashes from coming into the ocular surface. So the main factors to minimize risk factors for endophthalmitis are eyelid speculum and eyelid retraction, povidone iodine usage, face mask usage and no talking, hand washing and gloves. They also say the pre-filled syringe usage, anything, any of the uh, intravital agents which come in pre-filled syringes have a lesser risk of endophthalmitis. And when we're doing bilateral injections in some cases, we need to treat each eye separately with the separate instruments and separate lot numbers for each medication. So coming to the uh, last poll question, what is the site of injection of intravitreal agents? That's right. Most of you did get it right. It's, it is the pass planar. So six is anatomy. We need to know the anatomy of the eye to understand where we have to inject. So it is very important to know this. So the injection site is usually the pass planar. It avoids lens damage, avoids retinal breaks, uh, and avoids a vitreous base damage. It extends from the pass plicata anteriorly to the ora serrata, which is the termination of the retina posteriorly. It can vary in anteroposterior diameter, and nasally it's three millimeters wide, and temporarily it's a little bit wider. So that's why the temporal side is slightly more preferred. And also the lens zonules insert into the ciliary body, avoiding the pass plana. Hence, it's a very ideal position to give the injection. So another, this is very important because based on the age and the lens status, the distance from the limbus for giving the injection will vary. So in uh, in babies and in uh, infants, uh, it, it's a smaller size of the eye. There'll be either an anteriorly placed uh, pass plana or in ROP babies as an immature pass plana and a relatively greater size of the crystalline lens. So in these uh, babies, we have to give the injection a little closer to the limbus. So in one to six months of age, uh, it's around 1.5 millimeters from the limbus. From six months to one year, it's two millimeters from the limbus. From one to two years, it's 2.5 millimeters from the limbus. From two to six years, it's three millimeters from the limbus. At seven years of age, the ciliary body, the lens and the retina reach the adult size. So from this point onwards, we have to decide based on the phakic status of the patient. If the patient is phakic, that is the lens is still in situ, we have to give it four millimeters from the, lim the limbus. Whereas in a pseudophakic patient, it is 3.5 millimeters from the limbus. And in a phakic patient, it is three millimeters from the limbus. Coming to the seventh point, the technique. For the technique, we need to know the needle characteristics, the injection volume, the injection site, and the depth and the angle of the needle insertion. So the needle, uh, needle should be usually smaller than 25 gauge and 30 gauge one is the most commonly used. So the yellow one that you can see here is the 30 gauge one. 27 gauge is used only for triamcinolone acetonide because they are larger crystalline molecules. Larger needles are more traumatic and they can cause vitreous reflux and subconjunctival hemorrhages. So when we draw the injection, we put the needle first. So this is an 18 gauge needle. So when we're drawing uh, the injection, we need to first draw from the uh, with the 18 gauge needle and then change it to a 30 gauge needle. The injection volume is 0.05 ml. That's how much we give. The maximum safe volume to inject without pre-injection paracentesis is only 0.1 to 0.2 ml. So we don't need to inject more than 0.05 ml. The injection site uh, any quadrant can be chosen. It's commonly infratemporal or suprotemporal. The patient is asked to look opposite to the quadrant chosen and distance from the limbus is based on the age and phakic status, as I mentioned. And this video will show us how to do it. So this is uh, a four millimeter is measured because this patient is phakic and calipers are used to mention uh, the distance from the limbus. With the calipers, you can make an indent. You can see an indent here where the uh, calipers have pressed the uh, conjunctiva and the sclera. And the uh, injection is uh, directed at that point. So this is where the injection site is. Coming to the depth and the angle of the needle insertion, the depth is about 5 to 7 millimeters. So the needle is in a bit vitreous cavity. You can either enter perpendicularly or in an oblique tunneled insertion. The conjunctiva can be retracted to prevent scleral and conjunctival opening overlaps. After the sclera is penetrated, the needle is advanced towards the center of the globe and the solution is gently injected into the midvitreous cavity. 
Once the needle is removed, a sterile cotton swab is immediately placed over the injection site to prevent reflux. So in this uh, video, you can see the indent is there and the injection is being uh, entered in on that side four millimeters from the limbus and is directed towards the mid vitreous cavity. And then the injection is slowly injected into the mid vitreous cavity. So the injection has taken place. And the injection is removed again. The needle is removed in the same pathway that was entered. And a bud is used immediately as you are withdrawing the needle so that there's no reflex at that site. So this is how you do an anti uh, any kind of injection. As, uh, the dexamethasone implant is slightly different. I'm just... Uh, just showing a very small video to show you how to do it. We have to enter a little bit more obliquely with the bevel facing towards the eye, and then we make it more perpendicular. And unfortunately, in this video, it's not seen very well, but this actuator here that you can see in the top right picture, that should be pressed flush against the uh, applicator, and then only you have to withdraw. And as you withdraw, you have to place a needle, you have to place a cotton swab there because there will be reflux because it is a slightly bigger uh, needle. So I'm just going to show you the video again. Enter a little obliquely and then you enter perpendicular. And as you go towards this one, press the uh, actuator so that it's flush against the applicator and then inject the implant. And then press the bud at the site of the needle insertion. So a specific consideration is for ROP babies. For ROP babies, the distance is 0 0.75 to 1 millimeters from the limbus. The angle should be parallel to the visual axis to avoid lens touch. And the length is 32 gauge thin walled 4 millimeter stainless steel needle or a 30 gauge 0 0.5 inch needle where only one third of the needle is inserted into the eye and not the hub of the needle. So these are the precautions you have to take in premature ROP babies who require an anti of injection. So number point number eight is the post injection. That is what do you do immediately post injection? You need to check the intraocular pressure digitally. Routine paracentesis is not recommended in all cases, but if you do feel that the intraocular pressure is high, you have to go ahead with the paracentesis. Also ask the patient if he can see light or if he can count fingers. This is checking vision in a gross way. Use an indirect ophthalmoscopy, uh, especially as a beginner person giving uh, uh, intravital injections, it is good to use indirect ophthalmoscopy to look for central artery pulsations to determine the intraocular pressure. The eye, uh, we have to instill 5% povidone iodine when we are closing the eye and the eye can be patched for one to two hours. Post-operative precautions is the ninth point. Lid and uh, eye hygiene has to be maintained. Avoid head bath and hair wash for three to four days. And there should be proper follow-up instructions of when the patient should come back for a follow-up. And patient should be explained that he needs to review in case of pain, decrease in vision, or any other symptoms that he has not had before. Topical antibiotics, whether they, they need to be given or not, is controversial. But I do tend to give it for especially for single-eyed patients. But whether they help or not, as it's not routinely recommended for all patients. Final thing is the follow-up. For the, one of the main follow-ups is for intraocular pressure checkup. This is specifically needed in steroid injections where there can be an intraocular pressure spike, and especially if the patient is a steroid responder. And the follow-up also depends on the disease being treated and the duration of treatment. So with, whether it's the first time the patient is being treated or whether he's on a treat and extend, whether he's in a PRN basis treatment, the, the follow-up should be based on all this. Uh, in anti of injections, it's usually between four to six weeks. In antimicrobial injections, it's more frequent follow-up. When I mean more frequent, it depends. it's usually around 48 hours to 72 hours. We have to keep evaluating the status of the endophthalmitis, keep repeating either a B-scan or looking at the fundus and see if they require vitrectomy, if they're worsening or they're improving, uh, whether they require re-injections or whether they require vitrectomy. So there will be a more frequent follow-up in antimicrobial injections. The other thing to look for is look for treatment effect. And antimicrobial ex explained how in anti VEGF steroid injections, based on the indication, if it's a diabetic macular edema, look for the central thickness uh, to see if there's any resolution of subretinal fluid and the cystic spaces, and whether the patient is responding to the particular injection or not. 
another important thing is know what complications can happen and manage accordingly. So we do have to look out for all the complications that I mentioned before, uh, especially endophthalmitis, increase in uh, uh, pressure, uh, cataract, retinal detachment. So these complications we have to anticipate and we have to manage them accordingly. Uh, I just wanted to give a small point. This is my last slide, uh, known as a SAFO protocol. This is for ROP babies. Uh, this has been uh, described by Beck et al. So S-A-F-E-R, S stands for short needle, that is four millimeters in length. A is an antiseptic or antibiotic, that is 5% to 10% topical betadine. F is follow-up, that is 40 to 72 hours post-injection. So for ROP babies also, we have to follow up a little earlier, uh, similar to like an antimicrobial injection, to look and see how the vascularization of the retina is. E is extra attention to detail. That is a clean environment. Injection site should be correctly 0 0.75 to 1 millimeter posterior to the limbus. And R is recheck. That is one to two weeks following the injection and until the full vascularization of the retina or whether the, the baby requires additional laser, we have to keep rechecking. So this is a very uh, nice mnemonic to remember the safer protocol for ROP babies. So in summary, we need to establish the correct diagnosis. Uh, we have to priorly treat any active infection. And we have to follow all the pre-injection protocols, like doing a timeout, confirming the eye of the patient, name of the patient, confirming the indication, taking an informed consent, explaining the off-label use of bevacizumab, and uh, whether pupillary dilatation, yes or no, based on the surgeon's preference. So the, the fourth is the equipment. All the equipment should be sterile and should be uh, all available, and nothing. We don't. We shouldn't be going in search of any uh, any of these uh, equipments, and everything should be available uh, if you're planning for an injection. Asepsis, asepsis and disinfection is one of the most important steps. Povidone iodine is known to decrease uh, incidence of bacterial endophthalmitis, and is absolute in uh, absolute absolutely necessary for uh, prevention of endophthalmitis in uh, uh, intravitreal injections. It uh, The other important thing is eyelid retraction where the eyelashes should not come into the field and should not touch the tip of the needle. Knowing the anatomy and which age of the patient, what is the fecal status of the patient is also very important. And knowing the technique about how much you will uh, inject and what is the size of the needle and what is the angle of the needle and what is the depth of insertion is very important. And immediate post-injection procedure, especially looking for the intraocular pr uh, pressure and giving proper post-operative precautions to the patient and also following up the patient in the appropriate time to look for treatment effect and to rule out any complications. So uh, that's all for today. It is a large topic and I'm not able to cover everything that was uh, asked for. And uh, this can be, uh, each drug can be a separate topic altogether. Hopefully this was useful. And uh, if anybody has any more questions, they can contact me on LinkedIn or via email. Thank you so much. How long do you usually wait? Uh, how long do you usually wait before injecting anti VEGF after CVD or stroke? Uh, around three to six months. We do have to get clearance from the cardiologist also, uh, but usually around three to six months uh, later, and if the patient is stable, we can go ahead with the anti VEGF injection. And if the patient is suitable for steroid injections, let's say pseudophagic and he does not have any pre existing glaucoma, maybe we can go ahead with the steroids instead of anti VEGF also. The next question is, what is your frank opinion of pre-injection AC paracentesis in the setting of intravitreal injections? Um, I don't recommend pre-injection AC paracentesis. It's not required uh, because we will be injecting only 0.05 ml. The maximum that we can inject is 0.1 to 0.2 ml. So if we stick to 0.05 to 0.1 ml, we will not require an uh, AC paracentesis at all. So it's not recommended. So in cases where you need a vitreous tap and antibiotic injection, do you use the same entry point? Uh, not necessarily. It's uh, better instead of making a bigger wound, it's better to use two different entry points for the same. But depends upon the needle you're using. You can use the same entry point to give it as well. Uh, maximum volume, I already said this is 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 ml. Usually we give 0 0.05 ml. What is the opinion about simultaneous bilateral injection? I uh, personally do not prefer it unless the patient is very aged and he's not able to come uh, very often and requires it at one go. You do have to treat, like I said, you have to treat each eye separately and it's, it's better to get completely different set of instruments and completely different, uh, 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 even the, the dose, I mean, even the uh, batch number should be different so that there's no risk of endophthalmitis uh, in both eyes because of this uh, bilateral injection. 
Is it safe to give intravital dexamethasone with a, in a patient with traumatic endophthalmitis with etiology unknown? Uh, no, etiology unknown, it is not. It, bacterial endophthalmitis, especially with a traumatic with vegetative matter or anything which you're suspecting like wood or anything like that, it is not a good idea to give it. Uh, bacterial endophthalmitis, it's better to confirm it and then if there's severe vitreous inflammation, it's preferable to give it in those patients. Is there any advantage of... Uh, sorry. Is there any advantage of the oblique injection technique over the perpendicular way? Uh, the oblique injection technique will have uh, lesser uh, leakage. So perpendicular will not create a shelved path. It's similar to how you make a cataract incision. So oblique incisions will have lesser chance of leakage or reflux compared to a perpendicular way. But both ways are okay because it is a very tiny gauge needle that we are using. So the main reason to avoid head bath and hair wash is to not allow any unnecessary water or contaminants to enter the eye because we have done an intraocular procedure. So that's the main idea. Uh, uh, that's There's no specific reason otherwise. It's just to avoid uh, anything unnecessary going into the eye. Advantage and risk to superior and inferior injection site. Uh, my colleagues say superior is better because the upper lid shields the site from the outside environment better. Is there evidence for this? Uh, superior, uh, I mean, I don't know if there's any evidence. I'm not really sure about that. But um, actually, I feel inferior is a little easier because because of patients automatically having, everybody has a Bell's phenomenon where the eye goes up. So they have lesser tendency to move their eyes uh, when the eye is up already. So you can give an inferior incision, in, inferior injection that time. But supratemporal also um, is a very good option if the patient is able to look down properly. Is it indicated to give intravital injection in a sterile or clean room? Uh, a lot of people do give it in OPD settings also, but definitely there should be some sterility involved. It cannot be given just off the table. Uh, at least your tray, your sterile tray and everything should, uh, this one I personally believe it definitely has to be sterile, uh, but there are a lot of people who do it in OPDs as well, but we, uh, I give it in a sterile injection room. What is the safest anti vegf for one-eyed patient? That really depends on whether they've had any previous, there's no such thing as safest anti vegf but we can go ahead with uh, aflibercept or anemizumab. Both are shown, it depends on the indication also. So I don't think there's such, such a thing as safest anti vegf but definite, definitely with a retinal vein occlusion, I will not give brolocizumab. I will definitely avoid that. Is there any alternatives for intravital injections? Again, depends on the indication. Uh, indication. If you are talking about a non-center involving diabetic macular edema, you can do laser. But center involving diabetic macular edemas, you have to give intravital injections. But sometimes center involving diabetic macular edema, if it's something with a good vision and only small cysts, maybe you can try topical non-steroidal uh, uh, NSAIDs, anti-inflammatory drugs. But there's no actual alternative. Again, it really depends upon the indication. If you are having center involving DNME or a bit uh, a neovascular AMD, you have to give an intravital injection. You see patient routinely after injection, when please? So depending on the injection, if it's ozodex, I would like to see them after a couple of days or, or any kind of steroid just to look for any intraocular pressure rise. Uh, for intravitreal anti-VEGF, maybe on day one, and then you can see them three to four weeks later. What is the opinion about intravital triamcinolone? Triamcinolone is much cheaper. Uh, so patients cannot afford. Definitely, it is a cheaper option than dex, dex implant ozodex. But ozodex would be more appropriate for DME patients, especially if they're pseudophagic or they're non-responsive to anti-VEGF agents or they have certain prognostic markers on OCT which uh, say that steroid should be used instead. As a point of injection, the conjunctiva and point of injection in sclera same or should they be in different lines? Uh, they should actually preferably to be in different lines. That's why I said you can retract the conjunctiva so that it does not parallelly be on the sclera. So retract it and then give the injection. So when the conjunctiva goes back, it covers the scleral opening. Do you change injection site in case of frequent injections? Uh, yes, it is preferable. So whenever you doing frequent, maybe... Uh, like maybe a half a clock off from each other or half a millimeter from each other because we don't want the same size to become bigger and bigger. So yes, if you can see where the previous injection was given, you can give it slightly away from that. 
safest antivirgin and rop it was first bevacizumab which was first used and it's uh, known to be safe and ranibizumab was then used and aflibercept has been used in some studies now ferisimab no so far no studies and it's not fda approved for rop yet do you inject antivirgin when patient gave high blood sugar on the day of injection uh, no i would prefer not to inject uh, on the same day uh, high blood sugar will always give a risk of increased uh, uh, increased organism contamination so there is again a risk of endophthalmitis in that situation so i would prefer to wait then give the patient uh, this one so again high blood sugar depends upon the control of the patient so we have to take a call based on that also how do you prevent subconjunctival hemorrhage due to injection when you are looking through the microscope make sure you are avoiding a blood vessel because when you hit a blood vessel that, that's when you will uh, be causing a subconjunctival hemorrhage so you have to give the injection in an area where there is lesser vascularity so that's the way you avoid a subconjunctival hemorrhage do we do we give the two antibiotics together no we have to give vancomycin separately and ceftazidim separately but like i said you can con, uh, combine ceftazidim with dexamethasone and give it whereas vancomycin has to be given separately pupil dilatation for before injecting antivirgin uh, before it's not as important before as it is after after it is to use the indirect ophthalmoscope and look and make sure your central artery pulsations and your intraocular pressure is fine and to see if uh, example in dex implant in also dex you can see that the implant is there before uh, why is it important before dilatation maybe just to confirm that you're giving um, it for the right indication so that way uh, i also always prefer to dilate the patient and have a look before uh, before injecting antivirgin why is the site of injection and different in rop that's why i mentioned they are smaller eyes and they have uh, immature pass plana so they barely have pass plana they only have a pass plicata and they have a larger crystalline lens so if we do not go little anterior we will be causing a lens touch that's why we need to give it only 0.75 to 1 mm behind the limbus can we do intravitreal injection without a microscope um so i sometimes use my indirect ophthalmoscope along with my 20d lens uh, so that i get a magnified view you can also use a loop to magnify it so yes you can give it without a microscope but you have to use uh, something to magnify the area that you're giving in so that you can avoid blood vessels and your caliper measurement you can see properly in your indent you can see properly well administering antivirgin how can we prevent iodogenic cataract in a fakey eye uh, so like i said that the way to prevent it is to make sure your measurement from the limbus is exactly 4 mm and uh, we have to direct the needle towards the midvitreous cavity and not take it anteriorly so it shouldn't come anterior and it has to be directed towards the midvitreous cavity and exactly 4 mm 4 mm from the limbus what should we do in case of a dry tap i assume in endophthalmitis then you empirically treat based on the findings you have to give vancomycin ceftazidim dexa if it's an acute post operative endophthalmitis and keep following up the patient and uh, keep examining the fundus or doing a b scan and see if there's improvement you keep repeating the injection if there's no improvement you have to go ahead with the vitrectomy how do we follow up a diabetic macular edema patient who, who we have given intravitreal bevacizumab so if it's the first time you uh, uh you have to give uh, some loading doses so give at least three loading doses one month apart look for the effect of treatment also look at the oct biomarkers nowadays a lot of oct biomarkers which show that whether we need to use an intravitreal antivirgin or whether we need to use um, a steroid so also follow up the uh, anti also follow up the oct biomarkers and see if the patient is improving after three doses or not if not you will, might have to change the antivirgin or change to a steroid so also a uh, very important thing is systemic control in uh, treatment naive patients it's also very important to have a good systemic control injecting 0.05 ml versus 0.1 to 0.2 is there any difference of no 0.05 ml is the ideal this one so you can go ahead and inject that or uh, there's no difference in effectiveness of drugs because of that how many intravitreal injections will you do in endophthalmitis again depends whether patient is improving you can repeat and see wait for improvement uh, each patient is very different uh, you might have to take up for vitrectomy if you see no improvement what about the bleeding profile before injection uh, i don't really follow bleeding profile before injection but of course in patients who are on uh, aspirin or anything you can get a bleeding profile done or maybe you can just warn the patient that there is a good risk of subconjunctival hemorrhage in these patients because they are prone to uh, these uh, bleeding episodes 
divide lucentis vial between two patients and only one, only one patient for lucentis. Must we always do AC paracentesis or vitreous tap for ROP? No, we don't need to do either of these for intravital injections and ROP. Okay, what's the purpose of dilated, undilated pupil? I already explained this. How long do we have to wait since applying povidone iodine 10% to the next step? Uh, so you mean once you paint, you give it around two to three minutes. And once you put the drops, at least give it a minute or so before you go to the next step. How long do we give intravital antivagic for PDR? For PDR, if you mean without diabetic macular edema, if it's to regress a neovascularization, you give one and you see if the neovascularization regresses. If it's uh, resolving, then you can just observe. If it's not, you might have to go ahead with uh, panretinal photocoagulation. What are the roles of ophthalmic assistant during intravitreal injection? Of course, to set up the sterile tray and help in the draping and retracting the eyelid speculum, they are important. It is important to maintain sterility and to confirm the patient and make sure we're doing the correct timeout. All these are the roles of ophthalmic assistant during an intravitreal injection. RD after IV injection, yes, it is possible. It, uh, the mechanism is supposed to be because uh, posterior vitreous attachment is induced. And uh, especially, uh, especially in pe people who do not have it pre-existingly, and this can lead to retinal break formation and retinal detachment. That's why it's important to know the complications and do look out and do a full retinal examination along with the peripheral examination on follow-up in these patients. And explain to the patients that they do have to come if they see flashes or plotters of light. Is there an anti of selection method for different diseases, AMD versus DME? Uh, again, all of them are FDA approved. So if it's treatment naive, you can start off with any drug and change it accordingly. And uh, depends upon the follow-up of the patient. If they want a longer follow-up, you can choose other drugs. So uh, there is no selection method if it's a treatment naive patient. But obviously, if it's not, if somebody who's not responded earlier, you will have to switch anti vegfs in that case. What's the limit of BP and FPS to give anti vegf I don't think there's a particular uh, protocol for that. But uh, FBS, I would say at least if it's anything above uh, uh, 120, 130, I would definitely not give anti vegf And BP above uh, anything above 150, 100, I would not give an anti vegf on that day. For how long would you hold anticoagulant? You don't need to hold anticoagulant before injection. At least I don't hold anticoagulants before injections. In fasting and PP limit, uh, that's what I said, around 130 to 140. There's no proper uh, protocol for this, but anything anything above 130 to 140 for fasting and maybe more than uh, two, uh, 250 for postprandial, I think it's better to avoid uh, injections on that day. Office-based injections. Uh, you mean in the OPD setting, I'm a little uh, wary about those, but uh, of course, a lot of people are doing it and it does not seem to be an issue. As long as the sterility is followed and all the asepsis and disinfection methods are followed, then you can go ahead with it. But it is ideal to have a sterile injection room uh, for injection specifically because they are also at a high risk of anything going into the eye is a high risk of endophthalmitis. Do you disinfect the surface of vial of anti vegf with betadine before use? No, it's that is not done because we're not going to be touching the vial. We'll be directly drawing the uh, uh, the injection with the 18 gauge needle from the this one uh, without touching the vial of the anti vegf Pilocarpine to close angles before injection to reduce risk of raised IOP. I have never done this, so I don't have any uh, personal opinion about this. I'm not sure if anybody has done this, but uh, to reduce risk of raised IOP, you mean in patients with uh, previous closed angles? Uh, I have not done this, so sorry, I'm not able to answer that question. Uh, IVI in ERM cases, in yeah, ERM with uh, cystoid macular edema, of course, you can definitely try, but some cases will require surgery in the end. But you, there are many cases which we have seen where the CME can resolve with uh, intravital injection itself. Do you use Ozodex for naive patient? Yes, if it's a patient who is a pseudophagic, does not have a history of glaucoma, steroid response, you can try Ozodex. And patient, especially if the patient does not want to come for monthly follow-ups, that's also very important because if the patient is not interested in coming for monthly follow-ups, Ozodex does have a longer uh, the duration of action for at least three months before you need to repeat it again. So in those patients, you can do Ozodex uh, first. But ideally, again, depending on the indication, anti-VEGF would be the first choice if it's uh, 
uh, with a ARMD or uh, DME, but you can do uh, Ozodex also for an IU patient. A patient who already has peripheral retinal degenerative changes and indication for antivirus can be inject. If they have a retinal break, uh, definitely you have to laser before you have to do anti -vegers. There's no doubt about it. So there has... Uh, uh, there was actually a recent article that was published where the recommendations are given. There's no proper consensus about this, whether we need to. It's preferable if the patient can wait for injection. It's definitely preferable to treat anything which is predisposed to retinal detachment. For example, a retinal lattice de degeneration or retinal break. These have to be treated before we can go ahead with the intravital anti-VEGF. Thank you so much. Thank you.